weren't here uh, before the keynote. So the DPCH workshop this afternoon is cancelled. He's, uh, he's sick. We will be repeating uh, Carlos Prado automating reverse engineering with Python on the same time slot. So we'll have uh, Carlos workshop twice this afternoon for the people who are interested in that one. Okay, rest. So then we have the next talk with Russ Gillian. Floor is yours. I guess we'll go ahead and get this going. Um, hopefully Dan's talk was actually probably a pretty good lead-in, somewhat segue into this discussion, um, or this, this talk. Hopefully it'll be more of a discussion at the end. Um, the talk that is, is, well, we'll get into it here in a minute, but Paint by Numbers versus Monet. Actually, of all things, one of the original titles of this talk was uh, based around automotive tools. <laughs> And I wasn't sure if those would carry over to Europe or not. So I thought painting might be a little bit better than Craftsman versus Snap-on. So I wasn't sure if Snap-on was really known around here. So who am I? Uh, I am the Director of Model Research. Uh, I have led numerous red teams in the private and government sectors. Uh, from there, we moved actually into a lot of foreign attack profile and reverse engineering. Um, I have seen many, 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 many APT campaigns um, from all shapes and sizes, so uh, they all look a little different. I am the co-developer of Hermes, which is the attack research uh, malware engine. Some of my recent work has actually been in rec recent, or I mean, in integration of malware and attack profiling attributes into our penetration testing. So paint by numbers versus Monet. Uh, conclusion wise, I'll, I'll somewhat jump to the end of this. It's neither. The talk itself is a dissection of real world attacks and some of the effects it has on penetration testing. Reflections of on real offensive operators versus pen testers. Uh, all the conclusions here are derived from a forensics slash kind of binary analysis perspective. So reverse engineering, uh, on-host forensics, shell code analysis, etc. In this presentation, we've got multiple APT groups, not just a single one. We wanted to show the diversity of what it really looks like across many APT actor sets um, and how some of their personalities come out. So what this talk is not, and I want to make sure I, I uh, preface this, it's a not a slam on current pen testing tools. We will do kind of a, a deep dive into what forensics evidence of, of things like Metasploit leave around and the differences. Um, but I want to make sure at the beginning that we state that pen testing and operators in this kind of this whole APT scenario or targeted attack scenarios, they're not the same thing. Quit thinking that they are, they're nowhere near the same thing. So we have a birth of an industry. The industry that we all love, the pen testing industry, is almost, I wouldn't call it the security industry, but really the, the pen testing industry. We kind of realized that we needed to understand how attackers worked. Uh, when people were getting attacked, they were getting, back then it was mainly a scam, exploit, a lot of remote code execution over a network. So we picked up this, especially in the US, 
a uh, company saw a way to make money. Uh, and Dan's talk to me brought up actually, or is it a lemon industry? And you could ask this back in the, the late 90s, was this a lemon industry or not? And I don't know if I would call it a lemon industry, but I definitely would call it a money industry. I think that drives most of actually people's decisions. So we have this wonderful industry that we love and adore and we all bitch about all at the same time. But as an industry gets bigger, innovation has to happen. White Hat researchers, there's some really, really good guys, actually the H.T. Moore's law. H.T. Moore himself, if you've ever gotten a chance to sit down and talk shop code, etc., with this guy, phenomenally brilliant. Um, I would definitely say he makes some of Dan's um, you know, CS students look, look tame. Uh, but as, as the white hat industry, or as, as this industry goes, and it's, it's being built upon by white hats, uh, money becomes a shift. But attackers start to evolve in a different way. They employ varying degrees of malware. We've got various pieces of deception techniques, protocol and design flaws, evasion and anti-analysis. But the industry itself, the pen testing industry, doesn't evolve in the same way. Tools, tools, tools. Tools become a commodity. These guys can't do a lot of what they need to do from a lateral movement perspective without tools. So the shift begins. Memory corruption equals money. It's expensive to study memory corruption. It's expensive to continue to put time and effort into understanding ASLR bypasses, rock gadgets, etc., etc., and to continue to push towards this industry or push the industry in a advancement. An advancement, we start to see the shift, and we start to see money come into play. With that evolution, we get into making some strange bedfellows. As the pen testing industry, not to say that it's solely based out of the US, but I would say a significant amount of marketing comes out of, the, out of US based companies and some of the innovation out of White Hat, we start to have some really strange bedfellows. We start to see each other these real APT operators in, and the pen testing industry somewhat collide and work with each other. So with the intro somewhat done, let's really dive into it. Let's make sure that we clarify this. When we say APT operators in this talk, we are mean Chinese operators, okay? You can say China. It's not against the rules to say that APT is, is China, okay? Now, I know that they, when we have some others in there, we've got um, FireEye, APT LB, or something like that, basically. We've got some Middle Eastern stuff that's, that's coming out with this, too, right? Or in the news, we all see the blog posts. We all um, can't believe the amazing things that come out of these other countries. But for this talk's perspective, APT operators here are Chinese. So why do we really call it APT? It's not really advanced, especially as you just saw from the previous presentation. There are pieces of it that can be advanced, but they're not necessarily always advanced. They have strength in numbers. But what they also have going for them that the penetration testing industry doesn't have is attackers work harder, work as hard as they have to, but they don't really work any harder. As we step up the defense game, and there's been some recent, recent uh, steps towards advancement, we put it that way. Uh, you know, the, the, the game has gotten a tiny bit harder. I would say from an attack research perspective, we do a lot of unique pen tests, and um, we should really actually quit calling them pen tests. We, Unfortunately, we want to get some money out of this game too, right? So we call our, some of our tests APT sims. Uh, but really, it's actually targeted simulations. Uh, and they have gotten more difficult over the past few, several years. Uh, but for the most part, the game really isn't that, that difficult to step up. They, we really haven't had to approach it that much harder in the past recent years from a real attack simulation. 
This is in most places. There are some that do a really good job of, let's say, host auditing some unique ways. But from a targeted attack perspective, you know, there, there's roughly, roughly three stages in this that we'll go over. The first one's going to be getting in. As you guys know, phishing is a common route taken. Usually we have some type of an attachment. Uh, either that or an email with URLs, the zip archives, or with the binaries that are obfuscated that make it look like it's supposed to be a Word document, PDF, etc. Emails with malicious file formats in them, PDFs to office documents. There's a lot of uh, AVD campaigns that love to embed other file formats uh, inside of uh, various file formats, so a lot of Flash inside of, inside of Office, um, straight executables inside of Office files. But some of the times they also go through targeting the route of the non-mail accounts. So your user education uh, on their home email address is, they're going to click it anyways. Let's, let's be honest with ourselves. They don't really care. Whatever's been sent to them, they're going to go ahead and click it. But this is a route that we've seen them take. And they do commonly go from their personal computers into their, their uh, client or uh, company machines. So take example CVE 2010-2883. This is a cool type Adobe Reader, or Adobe actually, Adobe based product, Reader and Acrobat, buffer, stack based buffer overflow and cool type DLL. It was very, very popular among targeted spear phishing. In our collection, we have 22 unique samples with this exploit in But the really odd part is that seven of these samples are actually made with Metasploit's module for this, for this vulnerability. They didn't create their own. Seven of them, almost or roughly a third, are using Metasploit's module, and these are confirmed APT campaigns. So we'll take a look at this individual sample. In Metasploit, understanding the Metasploit module, if a host isn't vulnerable, it will pop open a PDF that says Hello World. When we dissect our APT, APT PDF, we look at it and we can see the exact same con content of the Hello World PDF inside of it. The shell code is the most significant difference. If you take a look here, this is our roughly, the shell code is the same in the samples other than the first mess or the second message or the second line of this where the unique shell code actually sits. Otherwise, between these two samples, from there down, is the exact same thing. If you take a look at that uh, unescaped uh, sequence of, of, of characters, it's of course the shell code. This is from the Metasploit module. This is from the APT module, or the APT uh, PDF. We've got double hex encoding. We've got uh, these, these percent U characters. Uh, what ends up happening is this bypasses any IDS or most IDS, IPS. Comparatively to this, this is really, really easy for IDSs and IPSs to pick up on. This is not. So what ends up happening is that it actually has to take and uh, factor or, or process all of these escape characters and then it actually goes through there and deals with the assembly or with the, uh, the hex characters. But really from here on down, this is the exact same code. This is clearly a ripoff. All the way down to the depth and ASLR bypasses. So on the left hand side we see the MSF created PDF. This is what the, the final, these are the final bytes, the final sequences right before uh, the two unique call structures for the shell code inside of the shell code. So much after this, um, uh, in each one they do, one has a dropper in it, the other has just a simple call home. 
So the original sample is actually off of um, Contagio. The dropper out of the original sample that this came out of drops this IGFXVER.exe. Um, as an AV, right, from an AV perspective, they categorize this family as the Schiffer racks. This is generally across most of the AV, AV companies. One thing that you start to see out of most of these APT campaigns is, in these APT groups and their personalities, is they like to keep things the same. They don't really work harder than what they have to. So if IGFXVERE.exe is running out of town and it continues to be successful, they're not going to change this. So even down to hosts or main and file names, they like to keep it the same at time. Our dropper drops Acroread32 into temp, and then Acroread32.exe starts up and basically just does a simple shell out with run DLL and drops this DLL file. This AV family is known as the, or this sample is known as the Protux AV, or Protux family in the AV markets. This was delivered roughly two weeks later. So from a pen testing perspective, we see this, the same table, you know, pool type DLL overflow. Uh, the link there is the original actual disclosure for this. This was not white hat based disclosure. This was found in an APT campaign and was then delivered in on the Contagio blog there. What happened with the Metasploit module is about over two days, um, JDUF, who now works for another company but was working for Metasploit at the time, took and ported the ROP and the uh, DEP and the ASLR bypass and the ROP gadget into a Metasploit module. So the attacker, two weeks later, basically just rips off the Metasploit module. Um, all they do is change out shell code and add a layer of uh, difficulty in there. But if we go back to that shell code from a reverse engineering perspective, they put in a couple more steps and make it a little bit more difficult than Metasploit does. But roughly, same basic technique. APT lateral movement versus pen testers lateral movement. This is where we start to see a significant difference. So once access is gained, long-term backdoors are established. Each group, and depending upon who you talk to, you know, groups can be 30, 40, 50, 60 APT groups, 20 of them, you know, everybody has their own philosophy about who and how and what, etc. But when we talk about in general APT groups, um, you know, each group has its own personalities and long-term backdoors are usually where you start to see some of them. I remember some that are extremely uh, difficult, string obfuscation methods, etc. but their custom packer is junk. All you have to do is look for junk EAX and you've got the whole thing fi figured out. So long-term backdoors are very different across most hosts as well as the way that they deploy them on hosts. Um, you know, we've got some that only deploy one long-term backdoor and we've got some groups that like to deploy three or four backdoors. From there, we usually see a credential harvesting of some way and then their lateral movement. We've got a litany of tools to do this. Mimi Cats itself has become really prevalent across uh, APT campaigns as well as uh, pen testers. We've got custom pass the hash toolkits. Um, I've seen one that the custom pass the hash toolkit actually never even gives you shell. All it does is play in and give you maps and drive to the victim machine or admin dollar sign of the victim machine. Never even gives a shell anywhere. That's because it plays into their, their general lateral movement strategies. Some of them, there's no hash hash needed, which is one we'll dissect. So we have an example of this. Incident response gig in March of 2012. This is Mannion's labeling of APT1. This is, this is one that attacked research did. The credential harvesting was done with Mimi Cats. In September of 2012, we see that same group at a different location. They built their own version of Mimi Cats in that time period. As pen testers, I don't think very many people are actually going and customizing their own Mimi Cats. 
They're still using the one that's been built off the shelf or that's still loaded in Metasploit. Again, this is general. If you're going beyond and writing your own Mimi cats, phenomenal job. Keep it up. So, evolution for credentials gathering. The custom Mimi cats essentially works the same way that the, that the uh, open source Mimi cats is. The only difference is that they write it out to a consistently named log file from where this, this executable was run. But otherwise, it's the same thing. Writing their own PS exec module. Again, can you see a show of hands? Who all here has written their own PS exec module for a pen test? <coughs> Not too many. General flow of this sample. So mps.exe is what the file was called. It was actually packed with a commercial packer. Um, I think it was the Maya. Anyways, NPS that actually you do a dash install, the victim IP address, and the name you want to call it on the remote end. This drops NPS.exe, the same, the same file on the victim's system 32, creates a service around it named NP server, and then starts it. And then inside of this binary that it dropped on the other file, or on the remote host, it uses name pipe for communication. So based upon the arguments, it's a service binary, or it's the installer, or it has a remove capability. Based upon the arguments passed in, we'll either fork to, I guess you guys are to the left, and we'll go down and start this file as a service binary. On the other side, we'll actually build, start building up the capability for installing. So on the dropper section of the code, all they do is do a fir find first file on the victim machine. The find first file comes back with nothing, or if it comes back with nothing. The logic goes get module file name, and one of the parameters there is uh, the H module, so right, the file handle. It's zero. In this case, it will grab a copy of itself and drop it on the, on the victim machine on their admin, admin dollar sign. So therefore, this is why we get a basic lay down or layout of, hey, how many arguments are passed in? Is this a service binary or is this the installer? This is the same file. So now we have one file being used to do everything. From there, it basically copies, like I said, you can see here, it copies itself to the, system, the admin dollar on the victim machine. This works on Windows 7, Windows 8, XP, doesn't really matter. The only, <clears throat> oh, we'll get into that here in a second, remote name pipes. So what happens from the other side, though, is it, once this file is started as a service, it creates name pipes and does all of the communication and shoveling of the shell over name pipes. As you can see here from the controlling host, the controlling host actually connects to a name pipe on the victim host. So your forensics evidence goes down even less. So taking advantage of credential authorization. Of course, this will not work in all situations. It won't work because, hey, we've got things like Windows 7 or Vista really up that prevent local admin accounts from being able to write to the admin dollar or C dollar sign or C share, C dollar share of the remote host. We also have to have some type of admin credentials. So again, this is not foolproof, but somewhat unique. In the event logs on the forensic side of it, you start to see the service name. NP server. This is, again, this is that optimization that we could pass this in whatever we wanted to call it. So from an event log perspective, this is what we see. Um, the S, the SIM, uh, somebody brought up earlier, I think it was a SIM uh, question or something along these lines. SIMs read event logs. This is, this is a standard capability. If not, uh, hey, you can syslog your event logs and look for these things. In the registry, we see this example. 
Really, this is just the HP local machine current control set of services, location, of course, with the service information in it. From a pen tester's perspective, in Metasploit, we have their PS exec module. The general flow is it still pushes a service executable with the payload to the victim's admin dollar system 32. It then uses DCRPC to create a service around them the service binary on the victim host and start the service and then uses payload defined variables for communication. From a forensics perspective, this is what Metasploit looks like in your event logs. Again, the wrapper around, or not the wrapper, but the, the registry key entry for your PSExec modules. From NPS.exe's usage screen, you can see here that they've built in the flexibility to call the service name whatever it is that they need to. So they've deployed a little bit of OPSEC for their binary or for their lateral movement. They can call this whatever it is you would like. Metasploit's options, you don't get this option. You don't get this capability. Its usage screen is pretty much preset for you. Even if you do show advanced, there isn't anything for, hey, can I mess with what it looks like as a forensics example? Again, the NPS usage screen shows the flexibility to offer their forensics evidence. Metasploits doesn't. Metasploits derives its forensics evidence, in this case, from two simple Ruby lines. Service name equals ran text alpha, so it gets eight random alpha characters. Display name equals our generation looks like m plus rand text alpha 32 plus 31, so 33 characters plus m. This is a pretty easy regex if you're syslogging or event logs from your Windows host. This is a stupidly easy regex to catch pen testers. So not blending in. Sorry, in case anybody needs to take a little bit longer to see that. I just hope there's some Irish people here in the audience. <laughs> I hope you're not mad after this, but I hope there are. <laughs> All right, a few lines added to the PS exec module and we have some flexibility. So in this new PS exec module for Metasploit, you can now register a service name and a display name. Again, the service name is just all that comes up on our HTTP local machine current control set services. The display name is again what shows up in the event logs. So in the PS exec AR module that we've created, you can set these things to make it look more like NP server or NPS.exe with NP server or whatever it is that some APT modules or APT actor decided to put in there. So inside of the event logs, it looks a little, it looks a little cleaner, it looks a little better actually comparatively to Metasploits. If you really want this module, it's available on our GitHub. I mean, it, it, it took a, no more than probably 10 lines of Ruby to, to adjust it or to uh, make the customization tweaks. So in conclusion, Metasploit's PS exec uh, module randomizes, randomizes service names, obvious badness and very loud. I actually saw a white hat researcher um, loud this when I was doing the research for this and said, hey, uh, this helps with uh, bypassing AV, are these random names. I think AV, I'll give AV companies a little bit more credit than that, that they can see past a randomized service name like this. The attacker's perspective, or the attacker approach, the operator's approach, customize the custom PSExec functionality that we can make it blend in and look normal, Use name pipes for basic communication. We're not opening, opening any extra ports. Protocols aren't, aren't a problem. This is all standard stuff. Very, very, very basic backdoor or PS exec module, if you want to call it PS exec a backdoor, that still isn't actually taught by AV. Um, a at the tech research, it, part of Hermes, we have our own uh, virus total built into it that's clean that doesn't submit our samples or anything to 
AV engine so that it would get caught or they ruin the forensics of it investigation that we're doing and I submitted this right right before major did this right before we left and it, this model still isn't being caught by any AV company. So in this case verdict superior the superior attacking technique or the operator's technique is much much simpler, much more effective and far superior. So staging the attack from a C2 server, so from the other side of the, the, the pond on this, we don't, we're not looking at on a victim host. We're looking at what they've done on the C2 server, what they're actually pushing down the clients. So on the desktop of the C2 server, we see 1.eml, rar2.exe, and rar2.gif. From a pen testing perspective, I still have to ask, when was the last time you ever got to prep a C2 server that you had for exfiltration? Very little. So the contents of this 1.eml, they've got a baked up email message already with rar2.gif already base64 encoded in it, etc. It's just rar.exe. They've got this stage ready to send into the victim. I thought this was a good, unique approach to this. To send into the victim for exfiltration. So they didn't have to download it through some C2 mechanism. They just sent it through the front door. Also found though on the C2 server is this mm.exe. It's a simple automation of their attack. AM1 helps speed the attack. This group was is known or is referred to as the UPS group, if you've heard of, if you keep track of all these things, but their, their kind of coinage of that term was when they first started uh, targeting systems, they would replace the UPS service. And so it was the UPS.exe service. Um, so that's where they, they got their name, was the UPS crew. Uh, really, really lateral, or I mean, really lethal once they finally get into a network. They're known for only using IE based zero days. Zero days is, is the wrong way to put it. They haven't released a zero day, they rip off somebody else's zero day. But once they get into a network, they're lethal. They spread lateral really fast and they install about three back doors, each of them having various levels of difficulty into them on each host. But the interesting piece out of mm.exe is we found out that RAR files aren't used for exfiltration or just for exfiltration. The dissection of the RAR file is this, uh, this mmx.exe is a self-executing RAR file packed, by, packed with UPX. I mean, come on, UPX? I mean, this is, this is like the entry level if you take a reverse engineering course and they have you reverse UPX as the, as the packer, you might as well get up and walk away and send your money back to them. I mean, come on, UPX, right? And this is what these guys chose to use. When it's run, it drops 2.bat and mm.exe and ctemp. The mm.exe and temp isn't the same as the mm.exe that's originally, that, that was just run. The new mm.exe drops another UPX packed uh, self executing RAR file, which drops 22.bat net 1.exe in town. The contents of 2.bat copies over a whole bunch of things. Is, he, is everybody familiar with the concept of sticky keys in Util Man? You replace files that auto get auto executed whenever you hit certain key uh, sequences of keys. Most of the time, people are doing this with cmd.exe, and I know of organizations that have been hit with UPS that they constantly look at setHC.exe and make sure that it isn't cmd.exe. They failed because in this case. Explorer.exe is actually what's being replaced. is actually being replaced with Explorer.exe. 
So if their if their check was actually, hey, it's just not set HC XE, but they do a double if and say if it's not and if it's CMD XE, go ahead and alert us. So in other words, a batch file defeats them. Also, they replace magnify.exe with the new mm.exe. Magnify.exe in the DLL cache and in System32. Again, this is uh, XP specific. This approach will not work on Windows 7. Just FYI disclosure. Then they rename things, delete things, etc. Once 22.bat is executed, they add a user of syslam dollar and give it <laughs> the password q a z w x bang at one two you know pound one two three um, as we've seen other uh, campaigns with these guys throughout the years they like uh, left-handed passwords it's really fast and qwerty who's going to do qwerty etc so if you have an auditing password auditing perspective you can do this with hosts and Maybe you should be looking for left-handed keystrokes. Uh, passwords that are based off left-handed keystrokes. Anyways, so once it creates this user, it adds this user into the local admin group. So now they've established secure communications because your RDP sessions, what they'll do again with this is they're gonna RDP into this host. And so they've got these secure or encrypted communications. You can decrypt um, RDP communications. It's very difficult. You have to have key, register key, and a few other things from a file, but it is capable. But for the most part, these guys have encrypted communications now from host to host, and they have persistence. So when they actually view, when they actually stick a key this host and hit shift five times, and Explorer pops up, they also hit the Windows U, which is the util man, which pops up. Remember how earlier it was looking and they replaced magnify.exe with the mm.exe? Mm Basically, is when they hit the util man with the Windows U, it pops up and they ask if the magnifier, if they want to start the magnifier, they hit yes, and their account, or mm.exe, is now executed. So again, they just continuously make sure that they've got persistence and they're adding themselves back in and over again. So why should they raise the bar? This works. They're not going to raise the bar. Um, building the SF, SFX RAR file takes seconds. This is really, really simple. We've got a batch file, or we've got a self-executing RAR file and a batch file that's inside of it, they get auto-run. With this one, this is the building kind of the external mmx.exe or the first layer mmx.exe and we put two .bat in there. From here, they'll build the second one and when they compile the self-executing RAR file, this will pull in the batch files. Again, this is just simple batch files. So from a pen tester perspective, how do you really deal with this? Batch files? I mean, there's no reason to make this any better than what it already has, that, that it already is. Batch files work really well. Do they possibly leave uh, significant uh, forensics evidence? Yes. Uh, possible Metasploit module, I guess you could build for this. I think it's kind of unneeded because we've already got, again, batch files. So no need for a complex framework, no need to leak information out there, no need for anything more complex than what they already have. So verdict again is attacker is simple and effective and doesn't work harder than what they have to. So conclusion, neither is a Monet or a paint by numbers. Um, APT operators are not highly sophisticated boogeymen. From a forensics perspective, they think about things a little differently. They're not pen testers. They don't behave like pen testers. They're not going to behave like pen testers. They're opportunists. They do what works. Whatever is needed to get the job done, they'll get it done. Even if it is writing simple, simple crappy <laughs> uh, exploit code and sharing it across many op uh, operating sets, they'll do it. So at times, each are a master painter. Again, as the white hat industry kind of grew and pen testing industry grew, we had to innovate. 
because in America, at least, if you want to become an industry, you have to innovate, you have to do new things, which is very combined of, or which usually includes a lot of build it, publicize it, make sure everybody sees it. And as you guys know, in our industry, there's a lot of advertising because that's how we make money. Operators don't work this way. They're simple. At times, each are a master painter, and at times, some are kindergartners. They, but they do get the paint on the canvas. Although that canvas just looks the same for both. Each APT group has its characteristics, as do most pen testers. The way I do something on a pen test versus actually a simulated attack are two different things. The objective of a pen tester is usually much, much different than a nation state operator. To give pen testers a little bit of credit where credit is due, they have tons of constraints placed upon them. And again, this is probably a problem that most of you, I'm guessing, can't fix. How many of you guys are CEOs, CIOs, or CSOs? <laughs> All right, then I expect you to fix this, Dan. <laughs> again, we have to educate them. Hopefully, we can help educate them with this. Removing those constraints and testing the system as a whole is much better. Pen testers are there though, really for testing individual vulnerabilities. They're there to make sure, can they get in? Can they get shells? The pen testers, the goal is usually how many shells I can get. Can I get onto the Active Directory controller? Can I get onto uh, the Exchange server? Nation state operators are after different things. They have targeting goals. Again, most pen testers are not given targeting goals. Pen testers themselves are not, being, are not testing the system as a whole. Again, a lot of the time the constraints are put on pen testers that they can't. But the system as a whole reacts completely different to pen testers than it does to nation state operators. The targeted effects on a system or system testing or or simulation testing, as we call it, is we're testing the monitoring, the triage of the process, because not everybody actually has reverse engineers on staff or incident response teams on staff, so it's a triage process. If there is an incident response process, we're testing that, the business con ops and the disaster recovery. I've had this argument or this discussion with others that say uh, incident response, now that if you're doing it all the time, it's not disaster recovery. I've been in situations where they yank the plug on 50,000 node networks doing R&D. Guess what? You're in disaster recovery at that point. And that's, it all started out in incident response. Um, special thanks especially to Dave Sayer and Val Smith on this. They helped us out and helped me out quite a bit on little pieces here and there for this presentation. Any questions? Awkward silence. No, it does. Um, first of all, about the looks of um, the uh, usage in the meta spot with the long obscure name. Free characters would probably work better because most IT people would look at free characters and go like, it looks like a service to me. Yeah. No, then having this very, very long name. Right. Um, and the second point about the, what you described at the last point, I think, at the end of the day, it ends up with us trying to explain to the board simple things that critical thinking would solve, but they don't really react to that thing in, in, in that line. They are, you cannot have this conversation because what you describe is now something that we should have told them and they would have agreed. The, the critical thing, again, I, I agree with, with your thoughts on that as well as, as some of the stuff that came up earlier. Critical thinking is what's going to solve this. I mean, from when we start helping build out defense-based solutions, um, we end up pulling a lot of security software apart and using it in ways that it wasn't intended to be used. But, um, AVs have the best rootkit on here, on, uh, on a network. Q 
can you use that? Can you leverage that capability? So critical thinking is, is a huge part of this, and that's really the only thing that's going to at least do some initial detection on this. Thank you. Just for your information, between 12 and 1, there will be lightning talks in this room. So if you want to do a lightning talk. So there is going to